Well, if, if, you were, if you were wondering what that applause was, we had no plans on starting the service this way. But you have been praying for Mr. Danny Thaler. He has been hospitalized for 83 days, and he is home for Christmas, and he made church tonight. So, God bless. So we, we can conclude our service. God has blessed. Merry Christmas. God bless you, Danny. We love you. Patty, right by his side. And uh, what a huge, huge blessing tonight. It's great to see you here. Well, we welcome you on this Christmas Eve, and uh, we pray for you and your family that it will be a special time to remember uh, what Jesus did for each and every one of us, coming to give his life a ransom for many and taking our place in the redemption plan of God before the foundations of the world. And so we celebrate the reason for the season, and we are sure thankful that you're with us tonight, and we pray again a blessing uh, upon this time. I'm going to ask you to uh, bow with me for a word of prayer, and once we have prayed, uh, 514 is going to start our service. And again, Merry Christmas, and God bless each and every one of you. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for this time of celebration, the hope of heaven and earth, the great joy that you declare to the shepherds on that first night by your messenger, the angel of the Lord, great joy unto all people that a Savior is born. And we rejoice in him. There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved, no greater name than Jesus Christ, our Savior, Lord, Redeemer, and coming King. Bless in this worship hour. We pray, God, that you would encourage hearts. It's also a difficult uh, season for many uh, because of loss and memory. But God, uh, you have made a difference, and Lord, death does not have the final say. Pray your continued blessing upon Danny and Patty and family, and we thank you for him uh, being able to be with us this evening. And we just celebrate his life, the miracle that you have performed. And uh, Lord God, again, we give you all the glory and all the praise. And it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I guess you can stand with 514 too. Let's stand together. Gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. To save us all from Satan's power, we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy.
At this time, we'd like to share a video with you this evening. that silent night when the stars turned their gaze to marvel at the earth when the heavens gathered breathless round a lowly stable when a young mother wept tears of worship falling on the baby in her arms and the song of the earth arose in Bethlehem soft as the tender beating of his heart and all was calm all was bright yet could this be the same god of abraham the conqueror of israel 
this baby, this fragile life? Is this child the one who burned his name in rapture across the gasping skies? Whose voice spoke the oceans into crashing rhythms? Who crafted the mountains into guardians of the firmament? Whose hand ignited the thirst of the deserts and the warring surge of the elemental hosts? Who breathed life from dust? Broke the oppressor's rule, scattered the chains of his people like sand, and led them through the wilderness with a pillar of flame. Is this child the one whose presence billowed thunderous on Sinai's peak? Who surrounded Job with the roaring wind, stood defiant in the raging furnace, wrote judgment against tyrants, and blazed on the lips of the prophets? scorching history's pages with the fury of his might. Could this be the same God who chose to come as the vulnerable king, setting his throne on straw and manger, drawing forth the tears of shepherds, receiving the gifts of wandering travelers, his fame unknown in this world? One who thunders through the heavens, yet whispers to our hearts. Who reigns victorious, yet bows to serve the broken. He is God in the fury, God in the silence. He holds this mystery balanced in his hands. Holds our questions till they lose their need. Until all we see is him. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the place And the mountains here reply Echoing their joyous strains
be seated. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Okay, this year's story is by an author named Judy Zwerbliss. I come from a family of rescuers. My two sons are officers in the military, one in the army, the other in the Coast Guard. They come to the aid of those in need every day. You could say it's in their DNA. My dad was a lifer. He served first in the Navy during World War II and then the Coast Guard, where he spent the remainder of his military career conducting dangerous air search and rescue missions for lost mariners. But the most important rescue mission was one that my family, more than 60 years later, still calls a miracle. It happened in December of 1954, a week before Christmas. I was five years old, my sister Joanne was eight, and my brother Jim was two. Our home was in full holiday mode. The tall fir tree was trimmed to perfection. The aroma of baking filled the house. Preparation for our annual Italian Christmas Eve tradition, the Feast of the Seven Fishes, was underway. It would be our first Christmas in our new home in Canada, and excitement was in the air. A few months earlier, Dad had been transferred from Massachusetts to a U.S. naval base in Argentina, a town off the southern coast of Newfoundland, he worked four days on base. We kids were always in anticipation of his arrival home. We lived a ferry ride away from the base in a two-story boxy white house in a fishing village of Placentia. It was quite a departure from the world we were accustomed to. It was cold, gray, and barren. The winters were brutal, even by New England standards. Mom reassured us that all was well and that we were on a special adventure. She managed to make our little house feel warm and welcoming, even for the other military families, too. That Christmas, though, Dad was on duty. We weren't sure he'd make it home in time to celebrate with us. My dad never talked about his missions in front of us. Maybe he didn't want to frighten us. He was a hydraulic specialist and aerial navigator, often flying in the worst of conditions. Even as kids, we knew his work was dangerous, especially in the winter months, though Mom was good at hiding her concerns. Snow fell three days before Christmas, covering the barren ground with a lovely white carpet. The temperature was just cold enough to freeze all the nearby ponds. School had let out early that day, and Joanne was home by noon. She told Mom that all her friends from school were going ice skating. She wished she had some skates so she could join them. At those words, Mom pulled a present from under the tree and handed it to my sister, an early Christmas gift, skates. Joanne wasted no time. Can I go skating now, she asked excitedly. 
Yes, said Mom, but be careful and be home for supper. Bundled in her heavy winter coat, hat, and mittens, Joanne flew out the door. She headed toward a popular skating pond close by where her friends had already gathered to spend the afternoon. It was a perfect day for skating, chilly and clear. The sun reflected off the ice like diamonds. Joanne worked hard to steady herself on the skates. Undaunted by her multiple tumbles, she finally made it from one side of the pond to the other. She was having so much fun mastering her new skill that she lost track of time, not realizing that all her friends had gone home. It was getting dark, and Joanne knew she had better head back fast or she'd be in trouble. She reached a remote part of the pond, not noticing the fissures in the ice until it was too late. Then, crack, the ice gave way. Joanne's tiny feet slid from out from under her and she plunged into the water. Surrounded by melting ice, she had nothing to grab. Help, she, she screamed. Her mouth filled with water. Again, she tried calling out. It was no use. The pond was deserted. Pure panic set in as the weight of her skates pulled her deeper and deeper. Her body trembled uncontrollably, the freezing water seeping into her heavy coat and the pores of her skin, and then she was gone. Joanne doesn't recall how long she was underwater, but suddenly she felt something pulling her out of the icy depths. As she would later describe it, a great big hand gripped at the back of my coat. The next thing Joanne knew, she was sitting on the ground by the road that led back home. She was still wearing her skates, but her boots stood neatly beside her as if they'd been carefully placed there. She hurriedly changed into them, scarcely able to comprehend what had just happened. Her coat was as dry as a bone. So were her ice skates. Had she imagined falling into the water? Her mittens told the truth, though, as the icy pond water dripped from them. The dark walk home would have been threatening any other time, but that night it was as if, as if a warmth were surrounding and guiding Joanne. Mom questioned Joanne as she came in the door more grateful than cross. Where on earth have you been, she asked. Sorry, Mom, lost track of time, Joanne said. She took off her coat and scrambled to the dinner table as if everything were fine. She was torn between sharing her near drowning and rescue or keeping quiet. What if no one believed her? The next two days passed by in a blur of holiday activities. The long-awaited Christmas Eve celebration finally arrived. We were all bundles of nerves that afternoon, not knowing if Dad would walk through the door. As we kept vigil by the window, we had one eye on the lookout for him and the other on the gifts. Around five o'clock, we got the best gift of all. Dad walked through the door, accompanied by two members of his crew, who would have been alone that night had Dad not insisted they join us. <clears throat> we all gathered around the dinner table as Mom served each of the seven courses. Dad beamed, clearly happy to be home with his family. After dinner, we settled in the living room. Joanne and I sat on Dad's lap, and he began to tell us an extraordinary story. A couple of days ago, he said, we were called out to rescue the crew of a Russian ship that was taking on water in the middle of the ocean. The room drew to a hush. We'd rarely ever heard him say more than a few sentences about his duties. We were all fascinated. Their ship was four hours north of us, he said, and it was storming something fierce. We knew the vessel was sinking and that time was of the essence. By the time our plane got to the general vicinity, though, a heavy fog had settled over the sea making it impossible for us to see anything below. The plane's fuel was getting low, and Dad knew that if they didn't see the sailors soon, they'd have to go back or risk being in trouble themselves. We have to turn around, the pilot told Dad with some urgency. We're their only hope, Dad said. Let's give it a few more minutes. Five more minutes, said the pilot, but then we'll have no choice but to turn back. Dad paused in his story. Just as we were about to turn back, he said, I asked the Lord to please help us find the sailors. In that moment, it was as if a curtain were being suddenly drawn back. The fog lifted. We could see several men on the ship's bow waving flags. The pilot flew the plane overhead, and I lowered the harnesses. As each man ascended to the plane, <clears throat> I reached down and pulled him to safety. Just as the last man climbed aboard, the vessel sank. I stared at Dad's strong hands, picturing him reaching out for those men, bringing them to safety. The strength and courage it must have taken took my breath away. Just then, Joanne said in a soft, almost inaudible voice, I had a miracle too, Daddy. She told the room how another pair of powerful hands, just like Dad's, 
had blocked her from those icy waters. Hugs and kisses followed. Was there a connection between dad's rescue of those sailors that night and the rescue of his own little girl? Perhaps we'll never know for sure. But all these years later, when I sit to pray for my sons, inspired into service by their grandfather, I'm not afraid, for I know that whatever they face, they're never really alone, protected always by a father's hands. I do like a story. Love incarnate, love divine, star and angels gave the sign, bow to wave on bended knee, the Savior If our world ever needed light and life, it is today as darkness and spiritual death is running rampant. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have a message that brings hope 
because Jesus was born on this night to give new life. Let's all stand together, please, and sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Christmas, everybody.
this morning after the choir presented their musical, and by the way, again, thank you so very much to the Forest View Choir uh, for their presentation and hard work, and uh, what a blessing that uh, was this morning, and thank you, Linda. The choir uh, sang this morning, months, uh, seemingly, many of you have been met with uh, unexpected news. Many of you have uh, faced tough times. It has not been uh, very easy in the last little while for our Christian church family here. Many people would deem it as bad news and very serious medical issues. Uh, Danny, your presence here tonight uh, really adds to this message about our God is the God of the impossible. Our God is a miracle-working God, and he is the one who is able to do far above that which we ask or think. And um, for you, God has not finished writing your story, and many, I'm sure, will be reached for the cause of Christ. And so, Danny, thank you for your willingness to be God's testimony through your life. But you know, the holiday season is not always an easy season. The holiday season often is uh, difficult because of losing those we love over the years, and more recently for a lot of you as well. So tonight we come and share with you the fact that there is good news even for those who are struggling. Man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. You know, it's just, uh, that's just kind of how life is, isn't it? The longer we live, the more we realize just around the next corner can be that unexpected phone call or that news that uh, we weren't planning on. But you know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is ever faithful. And God has seen you through more things than you could have ever managed on your own, nor were you ever expected to handle it all by yourself. And so we learn more and more how, who God is, and he wants to be a part of the equation, and he wants to be the solution, he wants to be the answer. And so tonight, the good news, even though we struggle, even though we receive all of this that the fallen world can bring against us, not forgetting the pain, not forgetting the sorrow, but learning from the experiences, not forgetting what comes our way, Tonight, we have gathered to proclaim the fact that uh, bad news, as we said this morning, does not have the final say. And you know, it is uh, trumped by the good news. And the good news is just another term we use for the gospel. It is exactly in Scripture, in the, in the original language, that the good news or the gospel it is synonymous they mean the same. And so tonight, as we have gathered, it's not just about news that we deem as being good. It is news that has been proclaimed uh, way back as we shared with you in song about the shepherds receiving that uh, glorious, great message of joy and hope. And that of an angel really, literally, being a messenger from God. And again, I draw your attention to what Beverly read this evening in the uh, 10th and 11th verse of chapter number 2 of the gospel according to Luke. But the angel said to them, said to the shepherds, as they were abiding in the field, doing what shepherds do, watching their flocks by night, and uh, doing the task that uh, many others would not really want to do. They were the lowest, you know, kind of uh, status, if you would. Uh, they were looked upon with disdain at times. But isn't it our God to appear to the unlikely, to uh, reveal this great message to those who we wouldn't think would receive it? Rather, we would think it would probably be a president or a king or, or someone of great status. But that's not our God. Our God is the God of the unlikely, choosing the unwise to confound the wise, the weak uh, to overcome the strong. And our God does not go by... Uh, our game plan, he goes by that which was written in eternity past. And so the angel said to them, 
Do not be afraid, for behold, I will bring you good news, the gospel, of great joy. Not just joy, not just happiness as the world would deem happiness. That is uh, suspect at best because circumstantially we ride a roller coaster in life, right? Up and down, and many of us live life life that way from event to event just trying to find fulfillment and and uh, some kind of um, satisfaction but I want to bring you this message of good news of great joy that is beyond your wildest dreams beyond what you have ever experienced and this good news this great joy which the good news will produce will be not just for you shepherds but it will be for all people. And that is the most far-reaching good news that has ever been offered to man. Not on one continent, not in, in one area, not just uh, specifically for a, a given group of people, but this shall be generationally and down through the ages that Jesus even prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, that the Father will give unto me not only you whom were his disciples at the time, but all the Father that would give to me in this salvation through this good news down through the corridors of time. And so it is expansive, it's extensive. It uh, goes beyond the uh, expectations of any human reasoning. And here is the good news. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And so this good news, brought by the messenger angel of God, bringing good news of great joy, which shall be to all people, it was water for the thirsty. It was comfort for the weary. This good news, this term again, is the gospel message. What is the gospel message? The gospel message is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, it was so sufficient, so satisfying to God because it was God in the form of his son, the Lord Jesus, who took on flesh that it satisfied God's wrath on our behalf. And that should bring us great joy. The book of Jude tells us that one day we'll be presented to the throne of God faultless. And we know that's not true. We know that there's a lot that we could own, right, because of our shortcomings. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's the difference between the law and grace. And that is what the good news is all about. The good news was set in motion by Christmas, by the birth of the Messiah. But here it is, folks. Before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ was the demands of the law. Thou shalt not, or you shall do this or else. And so it was a very tough way in which to live. And by the way, the law demanded perfection. The only problem is sinful fallen man cannot meet that demand. We can't measure up. And that's why a holy, gracious God reached down on our behalf, demonstrating his own love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before Christ, the law demanded that you measure up with perfection, but you and me, we cannot meet that demand. This is what Martin Luther said. The law exposes sin in all people. But what the law does not do is cure it, or remove it, or pay its debt. You see, the good news is that a Savior has been born for you. Not just any person, or not just news that we deem as good, this is great joy that is like nothing else. It is a heart change. It is that which gives us a new song to sing. It is a way in which we now think differently about the world that is in darkness, a world that has no hope, a world that uh, uh, truly him we are in a mess we are desperate but the great joy that the gospel produces through jesus christ the lord the savior that was given unto you changes all this he meets our demand he meets perfection before a holy god 
I don't know about you, but I don't want to take my chances standing before a holy God in imperfection where he is the perfect son of the living God and there is no sin or fault in him. And I don't want to see how I measure up in regard to standing in his presence. But God stands in my stead. God took my place, becoming sin for us. He paid the debt, he removes the guilt, and he satisfies the situation. And so, you know, often we, we give God our leftovers. We give God the time that uh, we haven't used and have uh, wasted maybe on, on uh, frivolous living or things that we deem as so very urgent instead of addressing those things which are important. You know, one day what's going to be ultimately important is where we stand in light of a holy God and his plan of salvation, whether we accepted his son or not. Not whether or not we met the, the, uh, the agenda of a certain day or if we... Uh, we, we filled our bank account, or if we had enough for retirement, it is our standing before a holy God, and it is satisfied not by the law. The Bible says if you're, if you're guilty of one area of the law, you're guilty of all the law. And that's what the law was about. The law was about exposing sin and being a schoolmaster and teaching us that uh, we could not keep it. But there was one who would not come to abolish the law or obliviate the law. One would come to fulfill the law so that we could have perfect and righteous standing uh, given to us by the favor of what grace does, what the law could never do. And so we give God the leftovers, but God's love demanded his best. And love always gives its best. And God gave his best, his only begotten son, full of grace and full of love and full of mercy by giving actually himself in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because after all, Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel. And in 1 Corinthians, and I'll, and I'll close with this, and you can say amen. Thank you. I knew what you were thinking. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also is your standing. And by the way, that's the only way you can stand in the presence of God, is in Christ and his righteousness. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Old Testament scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. You know what this tells me? It tells me that God keeps his word. And that shall be the final authority. Everything else in this world will pass away, but his word will stand forever. This message that brings great joy, nothing like the world had ever seen before. This message that is the gospel message, the good news that Jesus Christ came and he was born of a virgin that was established in eternity past in the mind of God and fulfilled. It is a message of hope for the hopeless. It is the living water for the thirsty. It is comfort for the weary. It is freedom for the enslaved. It is light for those who are in darkness. It is grace for those who try to live under the demands of the law and are frustrated by religion and can never measure up because perfection is only found in one and that is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is forgiveness just as the scripture says. I give you great news, the messenger, the angel, which shall be to all people and forgiveness is for all who come and call him and he will in no wise turn you out. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. And at this time, he is coming to share with you this evening, O Holy Night.
Thank you, Karen. Well, I'm going to ask uh, Jim Salhaney and, and Jason Myers to come, and they're going to lead us congregationally in silent night as we have our candle lighting portion of the service. I'm going to ask the ushers to join me also at the front. Has anyone not received one of the uh, handheld um, candles that were passed out earlier? If not, just raise your hand. We can get those to you. But the ushers will come by at the end of each aisle, and you can uh, pass that uh, light along. And once we get that all taken care of, we'll ask you to stand as uh, we, we sing this favorite hymn in closing tonight before, just before we pray. ask you to stand if you would you can look around at all the all the candles that's a, a beautiful sight
Well, I'll give you just a couple words of instruction uh, before we dismiss our service. Uh, there will be an usher standing at each door for uh, the collection of those candles and uh, when they're blown out, of course. Okay. And also, if you are here this evening and you ordered a poinsettia plant, flower, Christmas cactus, whatever you want to call them, uh, please feel free to take your selection uh, this evening in regard to that. And also, um, I had one other thing, but it doesn't come to mind again right now. But anyway, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. And we pray that God will bless you in this uh, ending of this year that has been a challenge for a lot of you and with hearts of expectation of relying on God's faithfulness again in the new. And we do not know what we'll face, but uh, God has it all in control and he is on the throne and he rules and reigns in the affairs of men and God works all things together for good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. And so again, God bless you. Merry Christmas. And Father, dismiss us with your blessing until we're called together to meet again. I pray you'd bless each individual, each family represented here. We have indeed, Lord, so much to be thankful for. Not good news as we would deem good news, but good news that your angel, the messenger of God, came that would produce great joy unto all people, for unto us a Savior has been born, who is Christ the Lord, in whose name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, and have a great evening.